shows up after you've laid the platform and we build on it, we build on it. Our job is to forget all of our formalities and literally move out of the way. And our job is to decrease and he will just gradually increase. He wants to show us, can I say this, how to do church in a way that it is effective. So I think God, like many of us, he's tired of us coming into his house and his presence and then walking out the same way that we came in. And I'm not just talking about deliverance from things. Even if you're not bound by anything, he wants to elevate you. Correct? Because we're going, 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, we're going from glory to glory. So he never wants the experience in his presence to be the same. But we have to work at it. I know that we're saved by faith, through grace, etc. But to get to where God wants us to go, we have to push. I want you to know that we have to press. Correct? From the beginning of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of God is preached and men do what? Press into that kingdom. And you have to see what God is doing. You know that God is breaking us out of concepts such as Baptist, Pentecostal, Apostolic. Although he's breaking those concepts because those are the concepts that will hold us. And God is fluid. You know that, right? God is the essence of fluidity. He wants to flow. He doesn't want to be constricted by your concepts of religiosity. He wants you to hear him in the mulberry trees. And when he goes, you go. And if he's not moving, you don't move. He wants that freedom in, our, in his church. Pastor told me that the, the, the theme of the conference, and I just want to give you four things. Maybe you can just write them down. I don't think I've got to shout anything at you. I don't have to do that. So you know that I can shout. <laughs> so I've, I've, done my, I've done it tonight. Joel, where were you tonight? I've done, I've done my thing tonight, right? So we've gotten past that. Let's just listen to what God wants to tell us. Listen to the theme that the men of God came forward with, restorations. And I went to the book of Joel because I think that's the best place to look. I went to chapter 2. I gave them verses 23 to 32. Maybe we won't read it. You can read that. But Joel promised us that God said that he's going to give us the rain, right? The former rain and the latter rain. And then he promises us that things that the pestilential spirits have devoured. He calls them locusts. He's not talking literally, you know. It's, it's a way of describing the pesty nature of demonic spirits. How they come into your life as though they were locusts. And they try to consume things in your life. And if they don't get that, then coming behind them, there's a canker worm. And there's a caterpillar and a palmer worm. God said, I will restore the years that you have lost. He goes on to talk about what your house is going to look like. Your floors are going to be full. Your barns bursting over. Then he reminds us that my people shall eat and be full. And they shall never be ashamed. Do you see that? There is no shame in serving this God. There's no shame in the worship that you offer to this God. He's taken away the reproach and the shame. Do you remember in Genesis when Adam sinned? He realized that he was naked. And what sin does, it brings shame because it strips us of the glory. So the nakedness wasn't that he saw that he wasn't wearing clothes. He lacked the covering that God placed on him. And that produced shame. When we're in shame, we do the next thing that we know which is to hide from God. We hide in different forms, you know. For Adam, it was trees, but we use different things to hide. We medicate the shame in different ways. We hide in different ways. Sometimes it's personalities. We hide behind that. Sometimes it's substance. There are different ways to hide, but God comes looking, doesn't he? Scripture said, and Adam heard the voice of God. That's amazing, the voice of puts on legs and begins to walk through the garden and God initiated the call. He said, Adam, where are you? 
That's the grace of God, you know, because you and I know that God knew where he was. You know that, right? Let me give you some theology. Where he was hiding, God was there. Correct? Because God is omnipresent. He was, can't hide from God. But God stirs a conversation. It's called an interrogative question. He wants you to look deep within yourself and ask yourself, where am I? In light of the goodness of God, where am I? And you know the story. But I want to show you some things that God has restored to us. And then I want you to walk in it. Can we go? I'm not going to follow all the notes. It's just not enough time. But go down to the things that God has restored and we're going to walk. The first thing that God gives us, and if, if, if I didn't say this, the coming of Jesus Christ is the restoration. Do you, do you understand what I mean? What Jesus has done in his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, he has restored all things. If you don't know, go to Matthew 28 and verse number 18. He says, all power has been given unto me both in heaven. Those are the spiritual losses and on earth. Those are the material losses. Then he says, now you go into all the earth. So I want you to know this. The first thing he gives to us, he gives power us back dominion that's what we lost and if you don't know what i want everyone to understand this because the body of christ what we do is through timidity perhaps sometimes it's through lack of knowledge we step away from our god-given rulership and god has blessed us that's what dominion is you know god rules in the heavens and now he expects us to rule on his behalf in the earth i didn't make that up the heavens belong to God, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. This is important. I want everyone, young and old, to understand that God has placed you back in rulership in the earth. So you are not a follower of people in the earth. You are a leader of men and women. And you must understand that. So Matthew 5 and 14 teaches us that we are the light of the world. So life is lit by the church. Are you with me tonight? And what the church does, the church looks for areas of darkness. And what we do, we shine. That's what we do. And when the light shines in the darkness, the darkness cannot seize upon that light. Our job is to shine. It's not to follow. It's to shine. I can, I can go on and on about shining in the Bible, about all the people who come out of the presence of God and they're shining. Moses comes down. He's shining. Jesus goes up and he begins to shine. And God wants us to shine in life. Light the way for people. How is it that as believers we dare to even entertain the concept of following unbelievers? That makes no sense to me. I will never follow an unbeliever, not because I'm disrespecting them, but the light cannot follow darkness. Darkness lights the way. Correct? So that's the first thing. Number two, we are supposed to be the heads of all of life's disciplines. Amen. So there is no discipline in life that the body of Christ should not be giving leadership and headship to. Now this, I'm, I'm kind of outside the church, so I might not get enough amens maybe from the people that came with me. But I want you to stay with me now. That means we're supposed to be the head of education. Amen. We're supposed to be at the head of government. Amen. We're supposed to be at the head of business and commerce. You're not talking to me. Because we're not just supposed to come and hide out in churches. Ye are the head. You're not the tail. You are above only. Never shall you be beneath. So we've got to sit down. I can't tell you everything tonight. We've got to sit down and think through what that means. Lest we intoxicate ourselves with church services that have no effect in the world. I don't want to be inebriated just by church services. I want to be empowered inside the sanctuary to go out into the world and bring transformation to the world. Talk to me, somebody. If you say amen, the word will be established. So over the years, we've become satisfied with just having church services that have no, can I say, secular, worldly impact. And the reason why God calls you tonight into such a service places his anointing on you the glory on you is so that when you go out into your different streams you begin to turn the world right side well pastor it's upside down so we turn it right side up 
That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's dominion. I want, to, I want you to know that in whatever discipline. He's given you wisdom. He's given you knowledge. He's given you revelation. You walk in his love. You walk by faith. You understand all things. You are prime for leadership. And the world, can I say this? The world waits for us. That's Romans 8, 22 thereabouts. All creation is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The whole world is waiting for us, even those that will not admit it. They're waiting for the church to be who Jesus says we're supposed to be. Can I quote a scripture for you? So the Bible says, arise and do what? Shine, for thy light has come. The glory of God has risen. Thank you, Pastor. 60 and 1, book of Isaiah. Lift your hands, everyone. Say, I have dominion. I have dominion. Say it again. Say, I have dominion. I have dominion. Say, I walk, I walk in dominion. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. It shall be so. Yeah. Number two. Number two. The second one. Could you go to the second one for me, please? This is what we're doing tonight. God has restored to us the kind of worship that moves the earth. He has. He's restored that to us. If I take my time and show you something. Again, I go back to Genesis. When God created Adam. I, I, I struggle to teach this because we have been so concretized in certain concepts that it's hard for you to believe this. But when God created Adam and released him into the earth. Well, let me show you quickly. What happens is the Bible says the earth was without form. It had no form and it was void. The word void means it was empty. So what chapter one is, God then steps out into this formlessness via his word and he forms the earth, gives it all the necessary shape, contours. That's why he begins to separate waters above, below, this, that, dry land. He's forming days one, two, and three. Days four, five, and six, because the earth was empty, he then begins to fill the things that he forms. So he populates the sky, doesn't he? Put stars, throws them up there. That's the greatness of God. Then he fills the oceans with fish and the oceans are teeming with fish. Beasts of the earth are coming out of the earth. And God's got this world now that is what? Formed and full. Now he needs a man to manage what is formed and full. So the earth lacks nothing. The earth, the earth has everything already in it. So Adam, when he comes, watch God again now. God does the same thing again. What he does is he forms the man, doesn't he? And then once he forms him, he, whoo, he fills him up. So a man who has form and is full of God steps into an earth that is formed and full. Watch this. Adam does not know nine to five. You don't want to say amen. You don't want to say amen. But if you say amen, he might deliver you from that. Because God had never intended for us to be laborers in the earth. When Adam related to God, as he worshipped God, what he needed came up out of the earth. You don't want to follow me tonight. You have him punching into work and punching out. You have Adam with a lunch pail going home to see Eve to tell her it was a hard day. The devil is a liar. Labor, sweat and toil comes after sin. But before sin, the boy just worships and what he needs comes out of the earth. You don't want to talk to me tonight, but let me talk to you tonight. That's why the Bible said in Psalm 67, let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase and God, our God, shall bless us. Out there working, sweating, saying this is how it is. Hustling, tussling, traffic. Ah, this is the will of God. That devil is a liar. Remember the language of God after the boy sins in the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread. That's after he sins. If you teach me that Jesus has redeemed us, has redeemed us from that, why are we still sweating? Laboring. When I sweat, I sweat in the right place problem is you're sweating some of you in the wrong place the place you should sweat is worship but you're sweating on the job sitting in church but you need to sweat in worship to get to where you need to go and you might find out that God has more than just the nine to five for you 
he has a blessing that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow to it somebody shout amen and i feel good tonight i feel good tonight shout amen he has a blessing yeah it's called a sweatless blessing he has blessings that come with no sorrow you got bosses beating you up and come get over here jane <laughs> you're running Sorry, boss. Right? That's why you, that's why you come to church all angry, kicking the altar. No. Sweat in the right places, and God will begin to take the church to where she needs to go. I will prove it to you before I go to number three. And when God delivers Israel out of Egypt, Egypt is a type of what we used to be in, where we had taskmasters over us, and we labored and watch and we build things not for ourselves <laughs> and they gave us wages but we we're building for another God pulls them out of that he whispers in their ear I'm taking you to a land flowing with milk and honey when you get there there are houses you did not build and there are vines you did not plant and i've got wells you didn't dig and when you are eaten and you are full you shall bless the lord your god who hath given you the good land am i preaching right tonight i need you to come tomorrow to a 8 30 service <laughs> i need a few of you at 8 30. <laughs> Me to preach a little bit but you have to believe all of that because the world has trapped us in a system and we've bought it and we have neglected our system our kingdom languishes while we work the kingdoms of this world do you follow what i'm saying that's what worship is all about the more you worship god moves you to a place of increase the very world will respond to your worship did you know that creation responds to your worship number three all the ladies in the house just say hey, hey. hey thank you ladies because god restores equality <laughs> huh did you know that brothers and sisters do you know that one of the things that god restores is equality maybe about six years ago i told our church we've got great people in our church but many of them don't believe me I told them, I said, God is restoring the woman now. This was long before Harvey Weinstein, long before Cosby, and long before Me Too. I told the church. Did you remember that? Were you in that service? I said, God is restoring the woman. And I said, the church had better wake up and stop talking about she can't preach, she can't teach, all that foolishness, because God is restoring the woman. How do I know that? Because the first to sin is the last to be restored. The last to sin is the first to be restored. The first to sin was Eve. She ate first. Then she gave to her husband. He was the last to sin. And the principle is the first shall be. And the last shall be. So the first that God restores is the man. It only makes sense. Because what he does is before he restores the body, he puts the head in order. That's why every man in the church should be in order. Then when the head is in place, before God makes his beautiful entrance, he then puts the body back in place. That's the woman. And he brings us back to that pristine, egalitarian environment where Adam and Eve shared dominion. Have you not read the Bible? Have you not read it? Male and female made he them and blessed them. Now you said, but she wasn't there. She was there. She was in him. Do you understand? So order is not the same as superiority. Do you understand that? Or inferiority. It's just that God works in an orderly, systematic way. He brings the head out first. <laughs> Am I right? Because <laughs> if the head doesn't, it's called a breach. 
brings the head out first, then he brings out the body. And what he does is when the head realizes that it lacks a body, then God says, what you need, watch, is already inside you. So what I will take out of you and build for you and then bring back to you so that you will recognize that what you see came from you. She is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. That is why when you understand that women come from us, it's foolish to abuse what comes from you. Because when you abuse the woman, you are abusing yourself. I think I'm in Ephesians 5. I know I'm in marriage, but I can use it in the church. Right? And so what's happening now, and you'll hear tomorrow when my wife comes, she's the better of a, a, a preacher than, I, I can just probably teach a little better than her, but she's a way better preacher than I. It took me about uh, 15 years to realize that <laughs> she was a better preacher than me. But what God does now is he puts us to a place where we realize that two are better than one. So what the church has to begin doing now is we've got to begin throwing out all this concept that you're a woman, you can't do. You're a man, you can't. We've got to throw all that stuff out because in Christ there is neither male nor female. Everyone is one. But here's what Satan does. And I'll give you my last point and we'll go home. What Satan does all the time, ladies, Satan runs ahead of God. And before God does what he does, Satan introduces a perverted form of something to always stay ahead of the church. Do you understand? So the church is not, can I say this? The church is not into Me Too because Me Too is a bunch of angry women. But the church is not trying to do Me Too. The church is trying to do equality God's way. Male and female. That's where we're trying to show the world that in the church, how did you, you got my last point, Rain. We are one in Christ. And this is my last point that I'm going home. This is beautiful. What's coming and what's been restored is the reign of God. May I show you one last thing? When I say rain, I know what you, you think from the heavens. But in the Genesis, water for the earth didn't come from above. Did you know that? Water from the earth, for the earth, came up out of the earth and watered the face of the whole earth. That's a beautiful thing. God's restoring that that saturates the earth and replenishes the earth. The rain is coming. It is coming. It's going to come. And I believe that with the glory, with the rain will come the glory. And the glory of God is going to cover the earth as waters. Let me say this. I want you to think bigger than you're thinking. I want you to think in categories that are impossibilities. I was teaching some elders today and I said, I, I was sat with one of the elders and I said, if you think about how God does things, if you really sit down and think about it, we would stop thinking in the categories that we think. I showed them, I said, Jesus was an extremely focused person, you know. He knew that he was called to 12 men for a season of three and a half years of impartation. So he focused on those 12 men for three and a half years. And as he was focusing on them, you know what happened? Thousands of people came. Now this is a beautiful truth, you know. When the thousands came, he didn't lose his focus. If you think about it, if you and I are pastoring a church and God said, I only want you for a season to focus on 10 people. And as you're pastoring, 10,000 come. The temptation is to lose focus and then begin to focus on the 10,000. So when the 5,000 walked away, Jesus didn't even sweat it because they were not his focus. The 12 were. Now I'm going to teach you something. When you are focused, you will see the results. He imparts to these 12, ultimately 11, add one more at the end, 12. Then he dies, he goes away. He leaves them in charge. On the first day when they go out to minister, watch. This is powerful. The Bible says 3,000 people joined the church on the first day. On the second day that they were ministering, 6,000 people joined the church. And in two days, the church was 9,000 people. And I asked the elder, I said, what do you think would have happened if they continued to multiply at that rate? 
the elder scratched his head and began to realize that it is possible for God to save the whole world. <laughs> when Satan sees that, that's why you have stories like Ananias and Sapphira and all of these things because that's Satan trying to interrupt that kind of growth. Because if I don't slow that down and at least try to halt it before I know it, every single person on the planet will be in this thing called the church. That's how God wants you to think. Those are the categories he wants you to think in this season of restoration. You lack nothing in this moment. It's there for you. Even if it has not yet manifested, it has already been returned. Do you understand that? So ask me, where does it sit? In most places, it sits in your spirit. And now what you're doing is you're waiting for manifestation of what is in your spirit. I'll close here, God. And eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, it hath not entered into the hearts of men. The things that God hath restored to them that love him. But it has been revealed to us by the spirit. You lack nothing in this church. Beg for nothing, pastor. You lack nothing in your life. It's just a matter of time before what you need is manifested in your life. Put your hands together, everyone. Come, would you come, Londa? Come. Come, let's stand. It's 10 after 10. Maybe if you have me come back for about 10 hours, <laughs> we'll just sit and have a conversation. Huh? We're living in great times. Keep ministering the gospel. Every nation, just keep playing, singing, doing everything. We're living in great times. We really are. I want your eyes to be opened that you might see what God has done. Take your hands and just lift them up. I pronounce a blessing on Homer. Am I losing battery power? I'm chipping in and out. I, do, I want to bless them without any chipping out. Can I use your mic just for a moment? I'm going to use her mic. Sound tech? Yes, thank you. And I'll give it back to you. Everyone lift your hands, even if you don't go to Wilmer. But so much the more if you go to Wilmer. I want to release a blessing of, upon this great church. A blessing of acceleration. A blessing of expediting the promises of God. In the name of Jesus, the Lord make you rich in all things. Pastor, the Lord give you revelation knowledge. The Lord empower you, expand you, give you room and land, enlarge your territory. I told you already, Pastor, give you this region, this community, one person at a time. In the name of Jesus, the blessing of God rest on Wilma. From this night, henceforth, and forevermore, the Lord rid this church of sickness and disease. In the name of Jesus, the Lord expedite your resources. Command finances to find you. In the name of Jesus, the Lord bless you, bless you, Crystal, to beg and borrow nothing, to want for nothing. In the name of Jesus, every door we command it to be opened over your life for nations. In the name of Jesus, the blessing of God rest in this place. In Jesus' name.